So we're just here at the Tuma di Giganti, the giant tomb of Kodu Vecchia, and this, or Vecchiu. This is one of the many tombs we've looked at. I've already described uh, what these are like, but I think one of the things that intrigues me is the fact that the earlier phase of the tomb, it was more like a long barrow. It was more, it was probably covered in earth. It didn't have the great stone at the front, and it may not have had the curved forecourt as well. But to me, not only does it represent a bull's head, which is what a lot of archeologists now think, with the horns, if you're looking at it from above, it could also represent a woman sitting there with the legs open and the vulva, the entrance, but it also has a phallic look about it as well. The upright stone, the phallic look, so it could be a representation of many different things, adopted and changed and altered from different cultures. Which one it is, we don't really know, but the, they were given the name the giant's tombs, potentially for two reasons. One's because they're so big, and so giants. Second, there were giant bones and giant legends all over this country for thousands of years. There's reports in 1953 there's, uh, of an eight foot skeleton up north, uh, slightly north west of here. Uh, other skeletons were found down, they came, uh, down the south, right on the south coast, uh, and many other places. So um, we have to kind of consider that. But it's just a delight to be here. And this one's made of granite. We've not seen one made of granite so far. Maybe the others of this part of the country are made of granite. That's an incredibly tough crystalline rock. And to me, I look at all the vegetation, look at all the farmland around here, and I see how well it's growing. And I wonder if they somehow manipulated and worked with the earth energies, much like many other cultures did. And this is just the, one of the examples of one of the structures they made to persist and to continue uh, for their ants for their future ancestors this energy which fertilizes the landscape fertilizes them and creates a higher level of consciousness because of the sophistication of design the measurement systems uh, there's probably astronomy here they all face variations on east so it's always with the rising sun at different times of the year um, so this one is virtually exactly east and so this could be an equinox aligned site the others have different, slightly different orientations, so uh, it's difficult to know exactly because some of them have been moved and shifted over the years. We're up on the northeast coast, way up northeast, uh, north of Olbia, and this is one of many in this area. And these are roughly 1600 BC to 1200 BC Bronze Age kind of times. And this one's surprisingly popular. There's quite a few people here today, so we're just behind it, getting away from the people, and uh, we'll go. We'll have a good look at the front of it and get some shots from above as well. Um, but this just inspires me because it's got this classic sort of lozenge shape. It's got relief carving all the way around it, and a curved forecourt, and with this great megalithic chamber at the back, which is like what we find in Britain and Ireland and other places in Brittany and so forth. Um, and so it does really represent something quite special here. And there's only a certain amount of these um, that are still intact. This is one of the most intact ones, actually. It's made of granite as well, so it's very crystalline, very powerful, hard rock, incredibly difficult to carve but obviously the culture here before this were carving great hypergeums even before these people arrived the so-called people who built the giant's tombs even though these are said to be the Naraji people they may not be it could be an earlier culture um, Azari is one of the cultures uh, that are known to have existed and cut the rock cut tombs so there's a, a mixture of styles starting to be noted with these sites Julian Cope mentioned this in the megalithic European book and this has been recorded as one of the most pristine giant tombs in Sardinia. So you can just see the back of the tomb here. I'm just going to zoom in. You can just see it goes all the way through there, right to the entrance. We're just walking up from behind the tomb. And we're going to go actually inside it in a moment. This is the back of the main monolith here.
So we're just inside the back of the tomb here and you can just see it all behind me just going up to the entrance and it's really quite amazing. It's like a long barrow or a megalithic chamber from New England and it is incredibly interesting. It's mainly granite. It's got some other type of rock as well, but mainly granite. So they were carving and shaping and placing massive crystalline stones to create these incredible giant's tombs. So this is Naraji Prisjona, which is just near the giant's grave. This is quite an impressive site. There's quite a few different round towers all around it. But we're gonna we're gonna come and check it out tomorrow, get a good um, have a good look at it, see if there's any spirals in there, any staircases. But the fact that it's so close to the giant's grave really fascinates me. It proves there's a connection between these cultures. So this is Tuma di Giganti Lilogli. This is not far from two other giant's tombs in this area. You can just see the size of this. It's probably what, 18, maybe 15 to 18 feet tall. It's incredibly large. It's beautifully done here. We've got, it's made of granite as well, much like the other one we looked at. And it dates potentially to 1800 to 1600 BC, at least the first phase did. This may have been added slightly later, which we do find with these sites, but you can see the curved forecourt here. I just wonder if any giant remains were ever found at these sites. Again, just from this angle, you can just see how thin this is. This is just like, it's like a modern gravestone. It's the same shape, same kind of a design, but we have this beautiful, unusual relief cover. And what these two segments mean, we don't know, but you've got the curve on the top and you've got the curve down here. This is obviously the entrance into the realm of the dead or the other world, potentially, even though this kind of face is east. And uh, behind you have like a megalithic chamber, much like we find in Britain and obviously the rest of Europe. Uh, but this part here, it could represent like a soul hole, like we find in Gobekli Tepe, you find in other places, in Germany, uh, Russia and so forth, so it could have some meaning there. But this just really intrigues me, because there's curves everywhere, you get the curve there, the curve here, there's a big curve here, there's even one over there on that stone there, so this is a very intriguing sight. Just next to the main, just to the right here, just next to the main stone, we have this as well. So this is kind of intriguing. So this could represent another doorway. I can't see this on any other, other stones, it's only on this one here and the main one. But we do know that some of these giant tombs have none of these portal holes on them at all. They're completely blank, completely solid, like a gravestone protecting the interior space. Whereas these ones are open to the world of the living, to the east. So you can see we're just looking at the giant's tomb from the back. You can see all this area, where all this, what looks like rubble is. This is actually the shape of the tomb. It was like a can. It was like a kind of mound covering the entire site with the main curved entrance at the front and then with a megalithic chamber coming down behind it. And there is a story that I was uh, reading about last night, which says that this site and many other sites, these giant tombs were actually repositories of earth energies. And this is a real legend, a real story that really grabbed my imagination. And it makes me wonder where they're placed, the stone they're using, the telluric currents, the megalithic uh, earth energies that are here. It does make me wonder if that is indeed the case, that these were special sites for healing and other such things. 
can clearly see the rubble here, which is part of the original construction. This is the chamber here. You can see this is almost identical to ones we find in Britain. Then we have the main stone at the front there, obviously. But this is a curved chamber. It's not straight, it's slightly curved. You can just see that from the shape here. So that's interesting in itself. Was that trying to manipulate and control earth energies? Or was it some other reason? So I'm standing right inside the giant's tomb here now. And after reading that thing last night, it's kind of really intrigued me that there might be something about this, might be something about the energies here at these sites. And they were actually healing areas and they were designed to pass through the entrance there and come back here to receive the healing. And uh, it kind of intrigues me, it kind of gets, gets me now because, and this is the fact that some legends may even state that, I do find really interesting. Uh, it'd be good to do some tests here, testing this telluric currents. But we know, because they're using granite, we know it has a piezoelectrical effect. We know the shapes of stones have fertility effects. So we've almost got like a phallic male and a kind of feminine shape here all throughout these sites, these giants' graves. And what it's made of as well, it could be different layers, could have been used in the construction of the mound here behind me. Um, and it could have just moved through. And with the curved chamber at the back, it does suggest there was something going on here. We know there's symbols of things such as spirals and other certain zigzags, which may represent these energies like we see in Ireland and Europe. So we have a block here, which I find intriguing. As you can see on the bottom part here, just on there, it looks like some kind of knob, some kind of protrusion has been cut as though it was sort of placed to next to another one with that, like, like a mortise and tenon joint. I wonder if that was part of the original construction. Just speculating here. I love these giant's graves in Sardinia. I think they're amazing. And I think if, you, if you're coming to Sardinia, this should be your primary purpose. The hypogeums are amazing uh, and all the other sites, the, the standing stones the Naraji's and so on and so forth, but there's something about these, these giant's graves. Now, whether they're associated with giants, we really don't know. It could just be a name given to them, but we do know that there were eight foot giants discovered north of, northwest of here on the north coast. So basically this is, you know, a potential grave site of these great beings. And there's evidence that the Beaker people were here around 1500 BC, around the time some of these were built. And if that's the case, we know they were very tall. We know they were not short people. And they ended up in Britain as well, and may have been responsible for Stonehenge and other such sites. So could it be that the actual giants that were found up north, the eight foot skeletons and other stories, could actually be related to the Beaker people because it's known that they were certainly in this area around 1600 to 1800 BC and onwards. And so if that's the case, then perhaps these constructions may have had something to do with them, or at least they could have done the later part and they could have buried their dead here. And we don't know if they were eight feet tall, but we know the Beaker people, when they spread throughout Europe in the Bronze Age, they were large. When they arrived in England, it was noted how big they were compared to the local British people. And so we have to consider that as a possibility. But it could have been an earlier culture. I mean, it could have been an earlier culture that originated here or originated somewhere else altogether. Perhaps even the Nephilim or the Amorites uh, and so on and so forth. But these are always connected with the Beaker people too. And so, yeah, there's a lot of questions, a lot of unanswered questions, but we must document and record these sites best we can.